Welcome to Not So Standard Deviations. This is episode 90, and I'm Roger Peng from the Johns Hopkins Data Science Lab, and I'm here with Hilary Parker of Stitch Fix. In this episode, we're talking about algorithmic bias, and we're all gonna fo- also going to follow up on using R as your first programming language and open source licenses. All right. Um, I think we should begin. Okay, cool. All right. So the first thing I think so the first thing we'll talk about is uh well is our next uh book that we're going to read together, right? Yes. Yeah. Um I can introduce it. Uh although I don't remember the author's uh, name. I'm going to look it up really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> this happened the last I think something like this happened the last time. It's like Yeah, it sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Oh, that I'm glad we looked it up because I actually always thought his name was Alan Garnett, but it's Alan Gannett. Oh, okay. And the name anyway, of the book is? The name of the book is The Creative Curve. Um, I believe, actually, talk about algorithms in uh, action. I believe I found this via a Google or a Amazon, like, you might be interested in this book. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was I was going in deep. So this was this book came out of sort of my design thinking, trying to find resources on design thinking. And eventually, I think when you're in the design world, you you end up like hitting this kind of creative world. Uh, so like people who study creativity, etc. Um, and so yeah, this book, The Creative Curve: um, How to Develop the Right Idea at the Right Time, sounded like. A promising prospect. <laughs> it all, had all the right words in it. it. Had all the right words in it, and um, and yeah, the the author is described as a big data entrepreneur. So <laughs> the buzzwords were appropriate. <laughs> but so like yeah, even like I don't know. I took a. It seemed like an interesting idea, and I read it, and it's it's been. A, like a paradigm shifting book for me um, just in terms of how I think about creativity um, and just in terms of like how to actually do creative work um, like, like pr- very practical advice. And so um, I would love for us to read it together. I think I, my head was like spinning with all the ways that we could apply this to data science when I was reading it. So I would love to have that discussion with you and just have that discussion on the podcast in general. Um, so yeah, I think it really complements the design thinking stuff well, because the design thinking stuff was good for kind of establishing like the paradigm shift of where, how we even talk about the work and the focus on the design aspect and like the consumer, especially. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas this is taking a step back and like can even be about art, you know? So it's a little bit more, um, it's a little bit more focused on like how to be creative in a, a tact a tactical way almost. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I'm super looking forward to talking about this on here. Um, and, yeah, that's probably all the intro I need to give. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I uh, I'm like maybe three quarters of the way through the book right now, so I will reserve any comment. But um, I think this will be a good uh, compliment to the uh, design thinking book. Um, awesome. And for those who are maybe scared off, I think we're going to do the whole book in one episode. We're not. <laughs> we're, not yeah. gonna, we're not going to drag it out like we did last time. Yeah, and it's it's a fairly fast read. Uh, I listened to the audio book, but it's. Like I was looking at the book and like it's pretty big type, you know, with yeah. illustrations. <laughs> it goes pretty fast. Um, um yeah. so we'll do that in the next episode, right? Yes, that's okay. right. So you have two weeks. That's right. Uh Get um, on it. Okay. All right. So we have a little bit of follow up from the last episode. Mm-hmm. Um Sean Cross uh oh, yeah. came through for us. So in the last episode <laughs> I had a extremely the discombobulated discussion about <laughs> like using R as your first programming language. Right. And, yeah. Uh, and I, I just, I, I didn't even know what I was saying. <laughs> I, just, I think, you know, it was at the end of the episode and yeah. I was confused and disoriented and, uh, and, but I did say Were you that. like hungry? <laughs> <laughs> I did say though that the whole discussion originated from conversations that I'd had with Sean Cross um, yeah, and remind me. So he was a postdoc. He with was you? A, he was like a like a programmer here at Hopkins. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. And then for a couple of years, and then he went to UCSD to uh, do a PhD. 
Oh, okay. So All right. Would... I was about to ask if he was. So it sounds like he did kind of like a, like um, I don't know. I don't know what the right word is. He but... had a job with us. Is I guess is yeah, how I would characterize it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and now he's doing a PhD because cool. Yeah. He was talking about kind of pedagogy and yeah. It, he struck me as someone who's like dedicated to teaching. Yeah, I think he definitely has an interest in that. And um, so he. So anyway, he and I used to have these conversations about like, what if R were your very first programming language? Uh, and, mm-hmm. and, but he remembered it far better than I did. <laughs> so it's still, I you know, it still strikes me as weird that you thought that it was weird to have R as your first programming language, since you teach it to people, right? And it's usually their first programming language. Well, in that rather class. than me try to summarize some incoherent thoughts, I would just I thought I would just summarize what he wrote, which he wrote a, a blog post on this topic okay cool and i think he made two kind of important points one is the kind of the distinction between how r is taught versus like a kind of quote-unquote real programming language like python or java or whatever and and typically the the quote real programming languages are taught at, at the intro level as like here's the language here's like here are the different types of data here are the you know the control structures and here are the loops and here are the if else and here's the bubble functions and whatever right you kind mm-hmm. of go through the essentially the the language specification mm-hmm. and then you say okay now that you know what the language is go do stuff with the language right right yeah and whereas in his experience r was taught as like here's how you do stuff with r and then if you want to do more this is the language and how you program it it's kind of the opposite essentially yeah, um, yeah, which, I agree with that assessment. That's absolutely how I learned. Like that I is, learned R in. Sorry, I'll just I'll just go on with my personal story, which is that I learned R in undergrad, um, in my intro to biostatistics course, um, and then and like I said, I didn't even really know to like write down what I was doing. Like I like I, it was totally interactive. I think probably the interactivity of R is a big reason why it goes this way, right? Well, definitely. And well also yeah. it's the it is the S philosophy, you know, on which R is based, which is that you start interactive and then you kind of transition to programming. Yeah. That's the philosophy. Mm-hmm. So that's why the language is designed that way. Yeah. And I would say I actually even consider I consider myself like a highly proficient interactive R user and a somewhat proficient programmer in R and like not at all an expert in like the guts of it. Like I think you're much more of an expert in the guts of R and like the the language aspect of it. Well, I think it ha- comes from having used it a lot earlier where things were simpler. Yeah, um, right. And it was much easier to kind of understand what was going on underneath. Mm-hmm. Um, now it's like the system is quite a bit bigger. Mm-hmm. Um but uh, so, but let me just go go on quickly. So this is the first point that he makes, and I think actually, so if, when I think about how I used to teach R, like you know, going back many years, I taught it as like this traditional programming perspective because that's kind of how I learned programming languages, right? Mm-hmm. And so when I would teach R, I'd be like, here, here's the language, basically, like here's how you, here are the different kinds of data, <laughs> here are the control structures, here are the loops, and you know, etc. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of how I taught it. And actually, my the R programming course that I have on Coursera, which is pretty popular, that's kind of how it's taught, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I also mentioned before, it's like because like back when I first started teaching it, you know, interactive systems were a dime a dozen. Like you didn't like you know they were everywhere. You had SAS, right. you had Stata, you had whatever. Yeah. And so like the the real novelty was being able to do statistical stuff, but in a programming language, which other languages right. just didn't handle that well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So then, so that's the one thing he says, and the other thing he says is that there's kind of a you know there's like an immediacy factor when you learn programming languages. So like if you learn how, like I learned how to program when I was an undergrad, um, mm-hmm. I taught like a, I took like a C programming class, um, <laughs> and there was not a lot of immediacy in terms of uh, my uh, using the language for anything kind of real, right? And I, like uh-huh. I took the class and then I just kind of moved on with my life. Like it wasn't like you know, I like maybe two years later, I had a summer internship where I did some C programming, but mm-hmm. um, it wasn't like, you know, mission critical, so to speak. Right? <laughs> it seems like it, sorry, I've moved my desk. It seems like it was um, more, it's like almost an academic approach to programming languages. Well, it, it is academic. Yeah, I would yeah. say. Um, and I think when you teach 
you know, when you come in as an undergrad, at least back then, you know, if you learn it as a sophomore or whatever, you you got like two years left to just kind of like, you know, you're just going to be in college, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And so, but, you know, if you, but like, you know, for example, I teach, if you teach graduate students, right? Mm -hmm. um, Often they, they, like, if they learn something today, they might be using it tomorrow, Mm -hmm. you know, because they've got some thesis that they're working on or some project and they need to analyze data. And I think that may be more common with R because it's like they're, they've got, people have come to the language because they've got some data analysis that they need to do. And mm-hmm. uh, they need, and so they need. They'll take whatever you'll you'll give them, and they'll use it tomorrow, basically. Yes, I agree. Yeah, and it, it's almost. I mean, the word that's popping into my head is vocational. Like it's much more. Um, Which one is? Uh, R. Okay. Where yeah. it's like you learn it the way you would learn a more vocational skill, where it's like, okay, we're doing this thing, and let me teach you how to do it, <laughs> and then you will do the thing. Right. Like, yeah. apprenticeship style almost right um yeah that's i mean and i guess that's the advantage of having such a highly specialized language i get is, yeah i guess so yeah. um i get i guess the one part that i'm missing because i don't you know i don't generally have this experience is like what you know what is it like to teach something like r or data science or both to undergraduates um mm-hmm. because they're in that kind of like, you know, if they're going to a four-year college, they've got a couple of years, but, and they may not be like you know, at a job yet where they're doing data science. So like they may not necessarily have the kind of immediacy um, mm-hmm. for, even for something like R, but they may still want to like analyze data or solve some problems or answer some questions or whatever it is. And so I don't know mm-hmm. what that experience is really like. Yeah. I mean, we, we should, you know, reach out to someone for the podcast who, (laughs) you know, to hear this firsthand, I think, but I also think it represents an issue that we're having in general, like the world's having in general with how to teach data science, because it is this much more task oriented or like vocational skill, but there's a real push to teach it in undergrad. And then the whole point of um, the design thinking sort of, um angle is that this actually is a distinct way of thinking so even though it's more vocational it still merits being taught in like elementary school because it's a type of intelligence like along with art and science so yeah it's an interesting question and i think we haven't i think we haven't solved it yet but my understanding from the people i do speak with who are teachers and undergraduate settings is that they're trying to shift their data science classes much more to like project oriented, in which case you would have that urgency to learn the language. So like, yeah. yeah. So I think essentially like simulate the real world (laughs) in the classroom (laughs) setting. But then that's where it gets weird for like, I can understand why the department chair of like a math department would be wary of that because it's, it is much more, I mean, the vocational maybe isn't quite the right word, but I think it kind of is, though. It's like apprenticeship vocational style. Um, well, I think that, you know, I think one of the things about computer science classes when I was taking them, and I think they're probably different. I don't know how different they are now, but, you know, the course that I took was not a C programming class, right? I mean, that's what it comes down to. It was more akin to a statistics class, you know, like like the, the linear regression class that you take in a statistics department is not an R class. Um, but chances are, at least nowadays, they probably use R, right? Um, and and so the class that I took for program for C programming was called Data Structures and Algorithms, right? It was a course to teach abstract concepts, um, but then all your homeworks were in C. Um, and yeah. so there was, to my recollection, there was no course on the campus that was like, "Here's how you program in C." Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, I mean, that that reflects also like why there's so many successful software engineers who like didn't go to undergrad because you essentially learn all those skills on the job currently. Uh, which skills? So like production software engineering type right. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, you, you miss nothing by not going to college. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you get like a jump start on a highly lucrative career, <laughs> right? Yeah. which is worth quite a bit. So, but, um, but yeah, I think though, 
I mean, again, I don't, I'm, I'm totally a broken record or like stuck on this kind of what do undergraduate institutions, especially like liberal arts type schools, like how do they, how do they balance this kind of drive in general for data literacy with the like, but we're supposed to be teaching like academic concepts, not like job skills. Well, um, I think yeah. this will change because I think one of the things, one of the problems with data science is that I think we're a little short on kind of abstract concepts in general mm-hmm. um, relative yeah. to say computer science. I think, you know, we have the field of statistics, obviously. So there's kind of like this theory there, um, mm-hmm. but that's just a piece of kind of like what we might think of as data, as data science. And I think, um, mm-hmm. So we don't, there's not, I don't feel like there are a lot of unifying kind of abstract concepts to, yeah. to teach. And so I really, the one class that I really wish that existed, I'm sure it does somewhere, is um, relational algebra. So like essentially SQL concepts, but yeah. not tied to the language. Because like, if you look it up on Wikipedia, <laughs> That's about my, that's about my like understanding of the quote unquote math behind it. But like, there are like symbols for it. And, you know, it's like, it is a general concept that is so coupled to the language that people think of them as the same thing. But like the success of, you know, dplyr or pandas is that they've essentially taken relational algebra and like put it into more user-friendly languages. Look at, look at, look at you. (laughs) <laughs> I'd say you, there, somewhere out there at a university, there's a class that teaches these concepts, and yeah. all and all of the students in that class are like, "Why are we learning all this abstract <laughs> bullcrap? You know, like exactly. why can't we just learn yeah. some SQL?" <laughs> well, okay, so now this is another point I wanted to make, which is that I feel like one time someone said this, and now it's branded into my brain as truth. But it was like it was someone teaching something, and they're like you know, quote unquote, studies show that the best way to learn is to like, try to do it once, like struggle through it once, and then learn the concept and then go back and do it again. And so I do think that having the real world kind of absent this in undergraduate academic or even like high school, you know, like primary, secondary education, like you need to be in the job to even do the thing the first time. And then you want to go back and learn the theory and then it would really resonate and to me it would like help me work so much better it's actually how i learned ggplot like i was kind of copy pasting code and you know didn't totally understand the theory and then i think i've told this story a million times but like i I ended up learning it the theory really well from dave robinson um where we'd like co-taught this class and so at that point it was like, oh, everything snapped into pay- place. And like, since then I basically haven't even had to look up code. Like I just remembered the syntax from then on. Right. Um, and so, because the concepts came into place. So yeah, I don't know. That's sort of, again, I heard one person say it once and I was like, that sounds true. I'm going with it. Like, <laughs> I'm sure what like, more with do you all need? these things <laughs> with all these things, a little bit of like research would help strengthen my argument, but I have not chosen to do it. Um, um. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, there is I but just to close the loop, but there I I'm sure there's a name for like whatever the theoretical sequel is. I just can't it does not come into me right now. I think no, I think it's relational algebra. Is it yeah, yeah. And I'm sure that's taught in computer science classes in departments, sorry. Yeah. I mean, I would love, I've, I've like done a little bit of searching to see if there was like a, a MOOC on it. Is that the appropriate pronunciation? I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. A massive online open. something, open course. Although they're not really open anymore. I so. know. I was about to say they're not open. <laughs> yeah. So an it's online course. I've, I've done like some research into this at one point in time so if any of our listeners know of resources for this like i'm all ears because i know there's things that i don't understand about relational algebra that i wish i could oh you know what would be fun maybe like you and i could take the course together (laughs) and then (laughs) we like talk about it on the podcast yeah I'm all know. in. That might be really how, I mean, how much do you feel like you understand relational algebra? Like, I mean, I don't. You don't use SQL. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you use the dplyr joins and stuff? 
Yeah, yeah. And I have used SQL in the distant past. Um, okay. So like the concept of joining and all that, I mean, that is the key concept that if I'd had that for my stats undergrad, my life, or not, I'm sorry, for graduate school, my life would have gone better. Like, yeah. it, I, I remember, I still remember Casper Hansen, like I had this issue where I had like gene metadata and then the like expression data. And I was like, how do I know that they go together? Like, I remember thinking that and he like showed me how and it was like magic. And he was like, yes, you can assume that these line up now. And I was like, oh, it's so great. Like, <laughs> You know, one time where the theory met the application in my head, um, mm -hmm. I, I was like, this was many years ago and I was in graduate school. I met this guy who was working at some like advertising company. And mm -hmm. uh, he was an information architect. Uh, mm. And I didn't know what that was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and he Love explained it. to me that it was basically like he organized how all the data were represented at the company. And uh, mm -hmm. essentially mm. like how all the data were related to each other. Um, yeah. And essentially organized all the database tables essentially. Yeah. And we hired, so we recently built out our, we call it analytics engineering. I think in other companies, it would be like a more traditional like BI team where they're building these like canonical watertight models, like data models, and then they um, create kind of views on top of them. And like every time, and there's someone who I really respect, uh, Andrew Andreessen on that team, who I basically go to him being like tell me the truth like <laughs> like because he like i'm i i end up building out a lot of uh data schemas or like whatever you would call it like like information architecture of like oh we have this totally new paradigm of outfit data that's actually pretty complex because there's a whole bunch of metadata with outfits and then there's also like a lot of relational data of like what's going together and yeah. like storing that and like the sessions you like you can totally you need like all of the event stream stuff for what created the outfits and then you need all the outfit stuff and there's a lot of like how much overlap is there between outfit like if you have an outfit and you just swap the accessory is that a new concept or not like what right. levels of granularity do you need so it's it, i feel like i'm just doing it on my own making stuff up and the like having some sort of like expertise in how professionals do that is like i'm so eager to learn that from people right. and then i mean full circle here like andrew didn't go to college and has been like working this whole time and also like approaches the work in this super intellectual academic way not like like he does a lot of work, but he also thinks about the concepts like in a systematic, like broader concept way. Yeah. And and is also really good at teaching it. So it's again, like this it's this weird I again I can understand why undergrad institutions kind of don't know what to do because it's it's like, uh, I don't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, it's like highly vocational. I'm just gonna keep saying the same thing. You know, one thing that's interesting it, it occurred to me is that I feel like, you know, the if you if you take the you know the the Hillary Parker model, right? Mm -hmm. Of uh, like first experience and then like abstract concepts and then like re implementing, you know? Yeah. Like I think the time at which the first experience occurs now is like has shifted quite a bit potentially. Yeah. Like, so like, yeah, I, like even in the last 10 years. Yeah. Like I never would have, yeah. I didn't see my first programming, like real programming language until I was in high school, you know? <laughs> uh, whereas kids are seeing programming now in elementary school. I just have to laugh because like, I didn't see my first one till college. So you never saw like basic or anything like that? No way. I mean, the only exposure other people did, obviously. And like, I actually was just overhearing this conversation someone else was having in the office that it was like a, a moth to light with it because he was talking about how he wrote his first like software that he sold at age 12. Um, <laughs> And it was like a calendar thing. And then this was the person I tweeted about. He like every morning, he has like a receipt printer that prints out his daily schedule um, from his <laughs> Google calendar. Oh, and wow. I was just like, oh, my God. Like, I, like, and I love it because I tweeted it out and like four or five people were like, 
I'm doing this. <laughs> and like, I'm sure everyone else, someone was like, yeah, you print it and then you take a photo of it and then you have it on your phone. <laughs> it's like, that's perfect. Yes. Yes. So anyway, it's a small subset of like paper hipsters who would actually want this, but I am one of them now. Um, what did that have to do? Oh, because you did it when he was okay. Never mind. Um, my yeah. well, my point is that like so, I, I oh no no there was an end to the story. <laughs> right. Well, my point is that I saw a programming language when I was in high school. I didn't actually program anything in high school. Um, well, yeah, like I could. I think if I'd been like a like a nerd like that, <laughs> I say nerd lovingly, but like I know you do. Yeah, like I I just I saw people the the closest thing to programming that I saw was people programming games on their TI eighty three plus calculators. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That was like a big thing. And I remember being like, those people are cool and they're nerds in a way I'm not. And there's part of me that wishes I could do that. And there's part of me that would never put the time into learning that. And that's and then I didn't learn it. And that was that. So I was, uh, I was like envious, but not enough to do it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so. I think that I, I, you know, the the freshmen coming into college now, they come from they come from a different place, you know. Oh, totally. And yeah. uh, maybe you could take advantage of that if you're teaching, a, you know, at an undergraduate level, because you know they you don't have to give them that first experience. They might have already had it. Well, some of them mm-hmm. might have. I guess I can't assume it necessarily. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, yeah, I think there's a general drive. And again, that's where actually the design thinking is helpful because I do think it would be, I do think it, there's, it's worthwhile to teach this as a type of thinking and a type of intelligence that's distinct from art and science. Um, and, but you would need applications in order to do that, right? Yeah. 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 So anyway. Well, thanks to Sean Cross for clarifying that whole discussion. Yeah, I, I, it's funny because I, I almost tweeted this to him where I was, I like saw it on my phone, like, you know, in some sort of rush context. And I just briefly scanned it to make sure that he was saying I was right. <laughs> and I think he was. Uh, sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like that your, your hesitation there. You, we, we might need another follow up blog post for him to determine, to more, more sharply right. pose the question to him. <laughs> He, yeah, he, anyway, I'm going to stop. <laughs> <laughs> I really can't let it go. Uh, one more piece of follow-up. Um, mm-hmm. Willie, uh, this is relates to open, our discussion of open source software licenses. Um, mm-hmm. And we talked about the Afero or AGPL. Mm-hmm. And we talked about it as if we do something about it, but we really didn't. Um, yeah. And so uh, Willem Lichtenberg on Twitter clarified that the AGPL doesn't prevent you from using the software in production. However, if you do, you you are required to open source all the changes that you make, mm. um, even if you do not distribute it. So let me. I actually, so I actually did a little homework on the AGPL, uh, oh, and so cool. I learned a little bit. And it comes down to, so the the regular GNU General Public License, you know, GPL version two, does not really come in. Does not really come into effect, uh, at least the kind of open source parts of it unless you distribute software, right? Mm-hmm. So if, if I take, if I write some, if I take, you know, your open source software, your GPL software, and I bring it into my company, and I just, and I make all kinds of modifications to it, um, mm-hmm. and then, and use it, you mm-hmm. know, I do not have to open source my modifications. Yeah, right. Because I'm not distributing the software to anybody. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but this has been pre-internet, it was kind of like, that that was it. That was the end of the discussion. Um, yeah. But then, as like the software as a service kind of model came about, you know, these companies were using open source software, modifying it, and then kind of providing it as a service on the web. Mm-hmm. And there was a question as like, well, is that distributing or not? Mm-hmm. Right. Right. And were, was, were they were they charging for it? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like not exactly distributing the way. Well, pe- regardless of whether there's people paying for it, people were using it, right? Yeah, right, and so right. it's like you know, it, does that count as distributing? I think it was it was essentially unclear, um, mm-hmm. and I think uh, so. The AGPL kind of it was modified version two of the GPL to kind of add like a workaround that was like, um, essentially to make it essentially seem like distributing, mm-hmm. um, and because it wasn't really covered in version two, so. Mm-hmm. Um, 
it's uh, anyway. It's an interesting. It is. It is interesting because it just kind of highlights how the original open, like kind of free software ideas didn't had a rough transition, I think, into the internet world and continue to. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I was just speaking. I was speaking with Wes McKinney about pandas recently, and like it sounds like there are philosophical differences between like him and Matt Dow, for example, about like like would he be upset about if someone was like selling like pandas plus, you know, where right. it's like souping up pandas somehow. And he was like, not at all, but it sounds like Matt Dow would be pretty upset if data tables, like if there's like data tables plus and someone's making money from that. Even if um, it were still continued to be open source. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, and I, I, that makes me wonder if they have different licenses for the two. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway. I guess the one final point was that, um, if you think of things like uh, like AWS, like these cloud services, um, and they have like software pre-installed on some of their images and whatnot, um, mm-hmm. I, uh, I guess the, the, well, the, well, this guy Willem Lichtenberg claimed that there's no um, AGPL software in AWS, like because otherwise um, mm-hmm. it, it would kind of trigger because it's being distributed, so to speak. You know. Wait, so they don't use. So they can't really use much open source software in that. No, they can. They can. They can't use a GPL software. Oh, right, right, right. Which is yeah. frankly, there isn't much of. I don't think. Um, yeah. Well, our studio. Our yeah. Our studio is That's, right because in yeah. And some people might be wondering why that is. <laughs> and well, it, I guess what they don't want is for someone to like make slight changes to our studio and start selling that. Well, but that could be prevented with the GPL though. The reason is why the question is why is it a GPL. Um, mm-hmm. And the reason is because our studio didn't used to be a, a software product. Mm-hmm. It was a cloud. It was kind of like a cloud service. Interesting. Uh, the original our studio, I think, was like a web-based kind of thing, mm-hmm. uh, okay. and so it was fell literally under this category, um, and then later became like a thing that you downloaded and used on your computer. Yeah. So uh, I think that's why it's AGPL. Um, Interesting. I I really did think that the reason it was AGPL was because it's they wanted to have people upgrade to the enterprise version if they were using it in an enterprise setting, and I thought the license was how they did that. Oh, so. okay. I I don't I don't feel like that's the reason, but anyway, you know yeah. what what do we know? I know it's it, <laughs> it's it's like interesting, but again, this is like almost it's not theory. It's kind of like business theory almost. <laughs> Yeah, and it it like strays from what I end up. I mean, I do want to know the motivations of not motivations, but like the boundaries that these various open source software developers are drawing. But I'm not sure that licenses are the most effective communication right. means for me. Yeah. Well, so. I think clearly not because I think there's a lot of software out there that uses the same license, whether it's like the MIT license or the GPL yeah. license. But I, I would be shocked if all those software developers had exactly the same opinion. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, yeah. No, know. it sounds like very much not. Right. So. so the license heterogeneity or the lack of license heterogeneity does not reflect, probably does not reflect the actual heterogeneity and what yeah. the software developers believe or want. It's like now there's people who like translate terms of service into like readable things for oh, lay people. Right. And it's like we need these for licenses because if you're not fluent in license, this stuff means nothing. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 Anyway. <laughs> um, all right. So that's uh, that's open source um, software. All right, you know, becoming a regular topic. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to open up a topic that I call, for this time at least, uh, this week in algorithmic bias. Mm-hmm. And uh, just because a couple of stories kind of came up, not necessarily like, I'd say they kind of came up in the last two months. So it's like, <laughs> we're not a breaking news organization here. Is what I'm saying. <laughs> it's like last week tonight. Right. It's like sort of news, but not really. Right. All right, continue. So there's two things in the related. One is, is an article came out in Science. Um, looking at a algorithm for classifying people in like a healthcare setting. Uh-huh. And the idea is that this algorithm is used to uh, enroll, to determine if someone needs to be enrolled in like a kind of like a, a healthcare kind of, what's the word? 
uh, like extra kind of care program. I guess mm. is how I, I can't remember what, what word they actually use. So the idea being that if you have a lot of chronic conditions that need a lot of management, um, mm-hmm. they will enroll you in this special program, which has more active kind of management of your health, you know, care. Mm-hmm. So right. like more nurses, more kind of people to follow up with you and stuff like that, mm-hmm. uh, which seems like a good thing. Yes. Uh, and But they use an al- – so some hospitals use like an algorithm that's a proprietary algorithm to determine whether you will get this recommendation. Mm-hmm. And it depends – and it's, you know, depends on a number of things. Um, and the paper found that like basically – so it p- provides this like risk score, right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and the risk score – if you look at the risk score, it compares black people to white people. Mm-hmm. Uh, for the same risk score, uh, white people were – let me get this right – were – more healthy than black people at the same risk score mm-hmm, right mm-hmm. and so, so it's like white people were getting into the program more often right exactly so the yeah, yeah. so the, when so the level at which white people would get kind of triggered into the program was at a healthier status um than the level at which black people would get triggered into the program yeah sounds um, about <laughs> I, I i was about to say sounds about right and that's Sounds it about sounds, wrong, though, right? Yeah, yeah. It sounds right in that it's wrong in ways that are like known biases. Well, it's interesting. So the the paper is actually is quite like detailed. They did a lot of things, um, and um, the, so the reason it's, this happens is because, and this leads into the next story I wanted to mention. So the way that the algorithm works is that the outcome that they model is the co- is cost. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so the idea being that if, if a person is predicted to be a high cost, like meaning that it's going to cost a lot of money to, uh, to, you know, to, to provide medical services to this person, mm-hmm. um, in the long run, that is, then we're going to intervene on them to like provide this kind of care program so that they can manage their health and to like not have to, not have to say go to the emergency room or, or be admitted to the hospital, which is a very high cost situation, right? Right. Yeah. So it's a money saving. I mean, money saving isn't even, it's like preventative care. Yeah. Yeah. It's like in, a, a, in a like bottom line oriented way. Right. I mean, I think yeah. you could kind of see how, why they would model costs. It's very easy to do. <laughs> yeah. Right? Like, and it, it's like, it's fundamentally what is a, like, there are good reasons to model costs. Definitely. And yeah. now, so if you looked at and the issue, and the interesting thing is that like, if you looked at for the same risk score, you know, what was the cost associated with blacks and white people? Um, mm-hmm. It was totally the same across all levels of the risk score, right? So mm-hmm. it wasn't biased in that sense, mm-hmm. right? So in terms of it, it kind of, ca- it kind of, cal- people were, the costs were kind of properly cal- calibrated for black people and white people. Right. Um, but it's just that. So it wasn't biased in that sense. Yeah, right. But the issue is that there's like, you know, there's, a, there's like another, there's, a, there's a kind of an unobserved variable, which is what we'll, what we'll call race, which mm-hmm. affects um, basically like that. Your, oh, go on. Go no, on. That, that basically that blacks were not money, not as much money was being spent on their care. Right. In general. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And so that's not reflected in the algorithm. But the fact that there's a kind of an underlying bias in how much money is spent on blacks versus white. Mm-hmm. Um then you know, kind of trans propagates into this whether they're kind of enrolled in this other program. So I, I, my point is that like I don't think that's like original. That's like a original kind of concept. But it was like you know there, there are other ways that algorithms can be biased. I think, um, mm-hmm. and it kind of all depends on like the underlying causal graph that like how race affects all the various things. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so it it's not always going to be the same. I guess at least that's kind of one thing that I learned from this. And maybe people who are more well versed in this area. You know, it's pretty ob- it's ob- more obvious to them, I think. Yeah. Um, I really thought when you started this that the algorithm would simply be modeling the ad hoc choices people were making. So like I I, I think about this a fair amount where it's like if you like with the outfits, for example, the point of the algorithm is to like amp up what ultimately is like expert decision making. Yeah. Um versus i thought that's what this would be so it's like if you know how often if people are just kind of admitting people based on like quote unquote gut intuition or or maybe they have some set of roles that they follow it's just like amping up that decision making right yeah yeah in like a non-opinionated way where you're not like trying to model the fundamental causal graph but it sounds like it was much more 
there is a different outcome and therefore i mean the the first one would have introduced bias also but probably in a more direct way that you're talking about where it's like oh like the healthcare system tends to prefer to like give tlc to white people right yeah and so the algorithm just amplifies that yeah right. so it, it still amplifies that but in like a more roundabout way <laughs> well yeah i think it essentially is what's going on and the way that it, it's just the way that it manifests is in the cho- in the choice of the outcome mm-hmm. in this case um and i think um and in the, and the argument that they make is that health is such an amorphous concept right and uh and very high dimensional and you know and difficult to characterize whereas cost is very easy to characterize yeah um, and so yeah. that's why you choose it um, right. I mean, that's the thing. If you were modeling like the gut intuition, you would probably get closer to the health. Like if you assume that doctors are making this decision just based on their desire to care for people, then um, and like seeing that someone has chronic conditions and being like, you know, I think it would really benefit you to be part of this program. Like then you could you could like address the bias in a more direct way by being like i mean i hate to say it but like even a quota system or something whereas the doing doing the cost seems less you're not going to model the complexity as much of health necessarily right yeah yeah um i i it's i feel like at the end of the day you um you have to have some understanding of like I feel like there's no way to do this in a manner that's uh, totally ig- kind of ignorant of like the underlying causal factors, you know, like it's just yeah. purely data based, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, I don't, it's not like I, I don't really research this area, but uh, yeah, um, you probably also just literally couldn't get the data volume you would need to do this well if you only modeled decision making. Maybe, yeah. Although I guess if you're modeling costs, it's like this, there's like a one to one data volume situation going on there. Yeah. I, well, yeah. I, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. I mean, are they currently opting people into this system or was it like a brand new system? No, it was, according to the article, is is in use, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, in fact, I think it was maybe in use at the author's hospital. Mm-hmm. Um. And interestingly, they they didn't name the company that built the algorithm, um, but they said that they went to the company after they did the analysis. They went to the company and showed them the results, mm-hmm. um, and and they agreed to kind of like kind of modify the algorithm to try to kind of eliminate this kind of bias. I guess. Yeah. <clears throat> what the that is a uh, I think that's like an ongoing thing. It's not like it's done yet, but. Yeah, that seems like a bad. Division of labor there. <laughs> Which division? The having the algorithm built so far from the the actual thing. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean that. Yeah, that's like my whole shtick, right? It's like the people doing the thing should be building the algorithm, like DevOps for data science. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I would. If I were consulting with these people, I actually would encourage them to just model the decision making as is right now. Yeah, and I think I think the issue, like you said, is probably that the data or those data are not systematically recorded either yeah. that well. Well, but but wouldn't it be because you would know you would have the records of who is in the program and who yeah. saw the doctor, right? So, yeah. yeah. But the features would be hard. But they have the feature, like the client feature, the patient features i should say right (laughs) so that would be hard but they already have that for the model so so the idea being that you would model who goes like well i guess what 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 would the outcome be i guess the outcome would just be did the doctor choose to put this person in the program i see yeah yeah like you would just essentially amp you would try to model that decision making process and then amp it up yeah but yeah. then also that assumes that you still have a continual stream of training data. So yeah. Like, we, yeah. Yeah. But like what, what I was saying was that that would be more intervenable. Like you could, you could like train the doctors to realize that. I mean, I think probably part of what's happening is that like black folks are just 
less likely to opt into the healthcare system because there's like, you know, skepticism or like, like if you're disenfranchised in a system, yeah. you're less likely to go to it. And the, like for good reason, when you look back at the history. Right. There is a like, bit of discussion about that, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Like the whole Henrietta Lacks and yeah. at, at your esteemed institution, Johns yes. Hopkins. That's yeah. yours too. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Yeah. And I went to a book signing and like met the family of oh, yeah. Henrietta Lacks. Yeah. It was cool. They yeah. were nice. I was like, oh, I'm at Hopkins. They're like, oh, like I'm glad that we could help you. Yeah. I was like, oh, that's so nice. <laughs> but anyway, um, the, yeah, it, yeah. I see. Yeah. Going on to the intervenable aspect, I think it's uh, it's like under this under the current scenario, like the intervention has to occur in some back room at some like algorithm like exactly. company, right? Yeah. right? Whereas, yeah. like in your scenario, the intervention could occur like in the hospital, right? Yeah, and like I mean, I don't know. I'm just in the set in the in the big data setting. I'm just so much more about behavioral models than like. I mean, again, this is kind of close to a behavioral model, but I just like with the outfits, it's like you can imagine trying to do like a logic based thing where it's like, OK, color, like let's go to color theory and blah, blah, blah. And this is what goes together. And here's like outfit formula. Like you could definitely create like a deterministic model for creating outfits. But I'm just like so uninterested in that. Right, right. Because <laughs> it's just like or you just have experts do it and you learn the rules that might not have even ever been articulated before right um yeah yeah so but that again that that does assume an ongoing stream of trading data which presumably the whole point of the system is to not have that anymore right yeah yeah and it wouldn't be bottom line oriented so like if you buy into the idea that saving money is good for everyone's health care because it kind of is then this wouldn't necessarily, like you would hope that they're correlated, but it wouldn't be the most direct way at like optimizing dollars spent on curing the most, <laughs> like treating the most health problems in a positive way for patients. Yeah. 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 So. I'm going to, can anyway. I go on to uh, part two of this discussion? Yes. So please. part two is that really is, seems unrelated, <laughs> but the uh, <laughs> housing and Irving, you know, housing and urban development, um, uh, department of the government. What am I saying? The Department of Housing and Urban Development, um, led by my former colleague, Dr. Ben Carson. Oh, um, interesting. Uh, he, Did you ever meet him? No. Okay. <laughs> I, one time I saw him walking down the hall. That's about as, oh, as far as I've wow. gotten. Man, um, it's so sad that he like torched his reputation. <laughs> well, that's, we'll like, save that for a different podcast okay. at a yeah. different time. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so HUD has come out with a proposed rule uh, to address kind of discrimination in housing. And it's a very long thing. And it's in, partly in response to a Supreme Court ruling from a couple of years ago. Um, and they, what they want to do is they want to protect the poor and kind of persecuted businesses that, um, you know, that provide services and, you know, in housing related services. Mm, that was not the direction I thought you were going to go. No, in. It was. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, in retrospect, like, yes, and anyway, go yes, on. <laughs> these people need protecting, right? So, yeah. Um, and the idea being that, so the idea, like, if you're going to claim, make a claim of uh, disparity, um, not just based on race, but any protected class. So, you know, under federal law, there's like six or seven protected classes. Um, and uh, if you're going to make a claim, of, disc of discrimination, you have to kind of, they, they basically have to meet five criteria uh, that are, d are new, I guess. Mm -hmm. And so that's, okay, so that's all one thing. But the thing that I wanted to point out was that there is like a, a specific mention of like the use of algorithms to classify people. Mm -hmm. And I think this, pro I'm guessing this comes up most when like for like mortgages. Yeah. Uh, so if you want to, if, if a company is going to give someone a mortgage, they might run their details through an algorithm and that will say, well, this person is high risk, low risk, medium risk, whatever, for repayment. Mm -hmm. And then you will give them the mortgage based on maybe that algorithm. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the, the idea is being that, you know, you might, someone might sue these mortgage providers or, or whatever companies because the algorithm is biased. 
mm-hmm, mm-hmm. based on some protected class like race. Right. Uh, and so... <laughs> Would this be the credit bureaus? Uh, no, not necessarily. It, it, it could be the banks, for example. So banks have their own thing on top of the credit score? No, they use someone else's algorithm. They don't, I don't think the banks write their own algorithms. I think they use someone else. They use like a you know commercial algorithm. Right. This okay. is, but this is important. That distinction is important, right? Yeah. So the idea is that you... You, if you're going to sue the bank, right? Mm-hmm. The bank can defend itself by saying that either that the by showing that the inputs used in the model are not substitutes for a protected characteristic like race. I'll just say race for now. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, yeah. the inputs are not substitutes for race, and that the model is predictive of risk or other valid objective. Okay. okay. Mm-hmm. So I think that's basically saying like the model is pred- predicting something that we can all agree is valid. Mm-hmm. Like for example, in the medical one, it's predicting cost, you know, which is a legitimate thing. Right. Yeah. Um, or they can they can show that a recognized third party that's not this you know the defendant, not the bank, for example, is responsible for creating or maintaining the model. Mm-hmm. Right. Or they can show that a neutral third party has analyzed the model in question and determined it was empirically derived, its inputs are not substitutes for race, and the model is predictive of risk. Basically, that someone, some neutral third party has reviewed the model and says it's okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, Interesting. So, <laughs> so they, they could either say, look, someone else developed the model, it's not our problem. <laughs> yeah, right, right. right. <laughs> Which is, I think is going to be most cases, right? I mean... Well, yeah. I mean, if the credit score is used in the model, which it like definitely would be, right? Right. Someone else developed that model. That's that's yeah. uh, FICO, you know. Right. So it's and uh, then oh, I mean, this just feels like made up. I, I part of me feels like it could create a lot of work for statisticians, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Because anyway, go ahead. Go on. Oh uh, no. Yeah. It's like getting this would be basically impossible to answer <laughs> well you would need a statistician to kind of review the algorithm right suppose presume assuming it was available um and uh and then to either certify it as okay or say or if you're on the other side say that it's not okay mm-hmm. so, right right um anyway it's uh i, I just so i think it's interesting because i think the ways that these things can go wrong are varied and, and mm-hmm. not always like extremely obvious and yeah. um, and so, but the, I think these kinds of rules tend to simplify them quite a bit. Yeah. No. It it feels like, well, okay. The what is so what usually happens right now is that whoever is developing it sort of says like, "Trust me, it's fine." Right. Right. So it's not like the existing system is much better, but. This doesn't feel like it'll solve the problem. I mean, maybe I don't know. Like, what, solve what problem? <laughs> of like there being bias in these systems. They're not trying to. Well, this isn't try to solve that problem, right? right. right? Well, I mean, no, but it is in a roundabout way, right? Because now they, the developers, have more of like a fiduciary duty to make sure that there's no bias in their algorithms, right? Because they could get sued. It, that's not entirely clear to me. Because like, it's not clear that. I don't know what the status of the algorithm developers is in terms of like whether they can be sued or not. But this rule mostly per- kind of relates to real estate developers and kind of those people providing housing services. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this that this is just saying they can't be sued. Oh wait, they can't be sued for housing discrimination because if they can show that it was out of their hands. Well, they're using an algorithm that's developed by a, another company. Yeah, and that is validated by some definition. But then, couldn't that company get sued? Like, what if I, there that's is unclear? Bias? I think that's yeah. unclear. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It it feels. I I'm just reminded of this discussion I was in um, with someone whose name I don't remember, but she was at Bain. <laughs> she was like high up at Bain. Um, on the algorithm side, and she had a really strong opinion that I really appreciated of like we will never be able to regulate this like it's just not regulatable because the expertise is so the the knowledge is too esoteric and the laws will be ages behind 
And so you have to rely on the ethics of individual data scientists, um, which I think is true. Yeah, but you know, I think it's also tricky because the question is, do you, are, are you, um, is the, what is the kind of what is the where does the wrongdoing occur? Is it occur? Does it occur at the creation of the algorithm, or does it occur at the application of the algorithm? Right. Yeah. Well, and and like dividing those, it like almost necessarily causes this problem to happen. I feel like. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because I think exactly right. Because it's not because it, the the two things they. You know, I think companies who develop these algorithms, they want there to be that modularity, right? Because then it allows them to kind of make more money, essentially, because they can apply the algorithm to many different purposes. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think if you look at the like the previous example with the hot, you know, the healthcare thing, it's like the al- if the algorithm is designed to predict cost, right? The, then it 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 actually does it does work, you know, so to speak. Right. Um, right. But they're using the algorithm to assign people into a program. Mm-hmm. Right, and so, but that's not the same thing, right? And the whole yeah. point of that paper is to say that using cost to assign people into a program is not—it's different, right? It's not—it's—it's it's a, it's a proxy for health, but it's not a perfect one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's like it's imperfect in ways that are that reflect like a system that disenfranchises people. But I think if, in that case, though, I worry that you could sue the company that built the algorithm, right? And they could be like, but they could be like, well, we just built an algorithm that predicts people's costs. Well, exactly. Yeah. And so I think that without like, I don't know, I feel like this election is making me think about like socialism or, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, that's like on the national mind right now with the Democratic candidates. And it's like, at what point, like, where is it the governor government's role to like protect its citizens and kind of enforce fairness where fairness wouldn't exist in like raw libertarian capitalism, you know? Right. I think, I think this is a good example of how the market can't produce that. Yeah, Um, because if the, the people who apply the algorithm pass the buck to the people who develop the algorithm and -hmm. the people who develop the algorithm say, well, those people applied it wrong. Yeah. Right. Then it's like, there's nowhere to, you know, there's right. To go. And there's just, you can't, like, it's not, it's not so simple. It's like treating the problem as so much more simple than it is. And it's like making this assumption that the system might be okay as is, you know what I mean? And I think where we're reacting is like, but as a society, like, like part of like where many people and definitely not everyone feel like society, the whole point of us having like a social contract within, you know, a country is that there's some degree of taking care of each other, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. And so it's like, oh, okay. And we're failing on that. So we need to fix that. And these algorithms are kind of like, it's okay as is. Like, right. Yeah. <laughs> let's just scale it up and, yeah. And, and like, it's just so much like head in the sand to be, to try to say, oh, okay, and none of this stands in for race because it, there's like simple ones like income levels or, you know, stuff like that. But right. then there's like a lot of complexity there yeah. that you would never, like a serious, a serious data scientist or like a serious statistician would never act like, okay, we solved this. Like, you kind of say like, well, we controlled for this stuff as best we could. Right. And that doesn't mean that we did. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. The, the, just the one last, the rule from HUD, you know, has this general kind of vibe to it, which is that, you know, these businesses should not be held responsible for like a larger societal problem. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. Which I think is an attractive reasoning, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) But it's, you know, I, you know, it's well, that's the disconnect. That's like exactly, yeah, that's exactly the problem is that's, that, right? That's what you're saying. It's like, have that discussion. Yeah, it's almost like don't get algorithms involved. <laughs> Just like, <laughs> it's like that's the actual thing people are fighting about, right? Yeah, I don't know. All right, that's um, that's all I have for this week in algorithmic bias. No, it's it's super interesting. It's making me think, you know, you made me think, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we got all the way to the social contract. It was, uh, it was yeah, just... like because I mean that's like the Apple thing with the face uh, unlock. Yeah. Like, 
there there is a sense of like the PR aspect of it not working for dark skinned people. And so it's like they Wait, did that happen? (laughs) Well, weren't you describing how like face on they like did something where they went all around the world and were like Oh, essentially yeah. collecting facial data from like everyone. Well, they, I mean, this is not, this is kind of unconfirmed, but the, 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 the thought is that they kind of did like an experimental design mm-hmm. and, uh, and tried just and to sample, you know, people, people's faces from all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. And like that, that only mattered if it were the old, like almost like the healthcare system thing is like part of the reason why that is, in the interest of Apple is because of the major PR hit you take right. when you create a bias system. But that's only like a recent thing <laughs> that people are aware and care about that, you know? Yeah. And so it's not necessarily traditionally bottom line oriented because these like minority groups are not as populated and therefore like it's not affecting your bottom line as much. Yeah. I think it, well, it doesn't affect everyone's bottom line in the same way. Um, yeah. And so different companies will be more or less incentivized to do the right thing. Yeah. Based yeah. purely on economics, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, purely on economics. And when you take into account, like, the, like, social media-driven outrage machine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which, like, usually I'm not. I mean, that's the thing. It's, like, a, it's such a like on knife's edge where it's like it can be really great and it also can be too much um i actually have to go to class (laughs) okay okay fair enough so i think that's a logical place to end (laughs) yeah cool